So we are delighted to be welcoming Jo with us today. And the reason that we're so fortunate to have her is we've been hosting her the last week at a workshop uh, that Living with Machines is hosting. Our project takes a computational approach to our nation's archives, using machine learning to explore the impact of industrialization on the lives of ordinary people during the 19th century. So this project has some really important overlaps with the kind of work that Jo does, working as she does at the intersection of British history, the history of technology, digital humanities and data science. For those of you who don't know, Joe's first book, Roads to Power, explored the transformation of road networks in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries and the role in making Britain an infrastructure state. Her second book, The History Manifesto, which she co-authored with David Armitage, was a very different prospect. It is a call to turn the tide against what they present as the narrowing temporal scope of histories and toward a long durée approach. It appeals to the duty of historians to serve the public good. An important argument for this approach is the increasing availability of data at scale and the computational tools and approaches with which to leverage that data. This rallying cry has had a huge impact within the history community, which has led to it being called one of the 20 most influential books of the past 20 years by the Chronicle of Higher Education. A judgment that I would support. It's a book that most historians have read it's a bold premise received some notable praise and some really fierce critiques, but I would contend that its ability to polarise opinion is part of its value for the Academy and the important role is it, ha it has had in generating much needed debate. Jo has just published uh, a book titled The Long Land War, which tells the history of ideas about ending eviction, especially around the mid 19th century land reform at the United Nations and its satellites. This is the topic of our second talk today, so please stay tuned for that. But before that, Jo is going to be speaking to us about the work that builds from her forthcoming book, The Dangerous Art of Text Mining. So please join me in welcoming Jo. Thank you so much for that, Ruth. Thank you to, for, to the Turing Institute and to Living with Machines for having me. It's been a thrill to be here with all of you at the workshops this week. Uh, I've been learning so much about the experiments in data science here on the ongoing, uh, using data from the British Library to peer into the world of data science. And those are some of the themes I'd like to engage in this afternoon's talk. We live in an age awash in text, organized into modern bureaucracies, armed with devices for typing and storing, transmitting messages in the form of text, Humans create a wealth of data that the world is barely prepared to deal with. In 2018, the world's population was 86% literate, and that literate bulk of humanity composed roughly 281 billion emails a day. Statisticians estimated that in 2017, cell phone users around the world sent 6.8 billion text messages every day. Grouped together as archives of the past, the records of text form data sets almost astonishing in scale. As of 2022, the National Archives of the United States had present, presently hold 13.2 billion pages of textual records, which combine with other sources to form 1,300 terabytes of data, which is big. But more concrete terms are those measured in distance. The British Library's holdings contain 746 kilometers of shel shelving, equivalent to the distance from Aberdeen to London. Text is big and modern data science only touches the tip of the iceberg, but historical analysis is accustomed to working across decades and centuries, asking questions about the totality of available printed records, even when that those records come in extremely different forms. The data scientists in the Living with Machines project tell us that their data set, which contains Victorian newspapers and maps, is the biggest and most complex of the data sets presently under analysis at the Turing Institute, outstripping in size the work of teams working on cybersecurity, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, as well as cyber medicine. The data is varied over multiple eras and cultures, and each of those subcultures and sub periods have rules for interpretation 
They have different sensitivities to how they will use the language for place or emotion or rationality. And the sensitivity to these cultural norms can easily break machine learning algorithms that were trained to work on Amazon reviews today, or which learned place names from reading the New York Times in the 1980s. Beginning a decade ago, the existence of enormous digitalized repositories of text began to attract methodological experimentation from many angles in the university. Now, some of those projects are extremely ambitious in terms of chronology. Perhaps the longest is the data set used by Alison McQueen and Justin Grimmer in their survey of advice manuals for rulers in Christian and Islamic tr traditions. Some of the work is disciplinarily counterintuitive. Perhaps, for example, some of the earliest experiments in text mining long-term change came from practitioners in biology, in the so-called culturomics project, whose authors declared that history could henceforth be automated. In this frontier of high experimentation, not every interdisciplinary project has been a success. A set of standards for the basic epistemological conditions of understanding has been missing. The approaches taken in data science, the approaches taken in literary studies, in political science, economics, or biology, could not be more different. We all use algorithms to talk about text, but we have different rules of what constitutes a law, a subject of inquiry, how the data is to be digested and parsed, which, which archives to use and how to set those archives into dialogue with each other. We have different standards for what, what, what constitutes a discovery worthy of insight. Now, in this endeavor, humanists and historians in particular have um, been some of the most careful critics, putting those separate papers from many fields into dialogue with each other, talking about where the big discoveries are and what is missing in different circumstances, asking questions about how we know when an analysis is meaningful and under what circumstances the findings can be generalized and how it is that enormous data sets talk to each other or don't. Now, one important insight in recent years has been the importance of understanding omissions and silences that can result from choices to work with one set of data rather than another. Witness historians' reaction to one study of the history of incest in the so-called weird countries, that is, Western-educated, industrialized, rich democracies. This, is, this was published in the journal Science. The study concluded that prohibitions on incest in Christianity made Europeans cleverer and more open to strangers. But the authors of the study, as it turns out, had ignored evidence that had been published and even turned into data sets by historians, wherein scholars made it clear that early modern European royal families often favored incest, while important bans on incest have also been identified in cultures outside of Europe. For some historians who reacted on social media, the weird study furnished an illustration of the ease with which technical specialists reduplicate findings suggested by their own bias about the past. In this case, a bias about the super rationality of European historical traditions. For the historians who reacted to the study in the Perspectives magazine of the American Historical Association, the problem with the weird study was more precise. It revealed how anthropologists and technical experts easily overlook the sources the entire range of different data sets, which only historians seem to have full familiarity with. The critique demonstrated that interdisciplinary re research can fall into danger when scholars fail to seek out the best data for the question. Missing data is no way to analyze data. So the result of not thinking clearly about power in the archives is to produce caricatures that either don't make sense or that callously distort the past. Here's another example. A few years ago, also in science, a group of art historians and data scientists published a fascinating study of human migration whose results were mined from data troves based on the work of European art historians of the 19th century. They had records of travels across all of Europe and indeed all of the world. Because the data reflected European perspectives, the data also reflected European history, and it was riddled with all sorts of silences about non-Europeans who traveled for various reasons. And the accompanying article ruminated on these silences in an intelligent fashion. But a video 
produced of the data science, which was published alongside the article, was less careful. Rendered into data-driven animations, the data from the study showed a video history of human movement since the beginning of time, in which white missionaries were the first humans to visit North America and Asia. The millions of enslaved persons shipped across the Atlantic in the Atlantic slave trade were simply missing. They're not part of the world history as narrated in the video. It's a beautiful example of data-driven history. It was a beautiful vi example of, of craft of data visualization, but it reproduced a just distorted and triumphalist narrative of the history of the world via colonization. The accompanying voiceover presented white migration as the sovereign fact of history worth narrating, demonstrating a lack of critical engagement with the traditions of history. Data analysts who have not been trained in the humanities and social sciences are especially vulnerable to kinds of analysis produced from data about moments in time. An incomplete familiarity with the traditions of pa the past makes it easy to produce one set of data analysis without really understanding the larger story that it's part of. And I understand this. I understand, in fact, the failure of both of these high profile publications is depending upon a division of labor in historical knowledge. The indiv individuals who study history are trained to be aware of the pitfalls of using one archive but not another, one tradition but not another. M modern training in the humanities almost always considers the problem of the written data of the past and what text itself leaves out, which might be recovered from other kinds of sources about the past. But the emerging world of technical analysis and databases has been driven from outside history with the result of some embarrassing lapses. Now, not all of those lapses are as, pre are as predictable as you might think. One model of things to come can be found in the output of GPT-3, the machine learning platform developed by Google Brain that provides real-time text-based answers that can be trained on any database of text, but which are typically trained on collections of Western books and newspapers. The result is a bot that manufactures answers to questions about anything, but you can ask it questions about history. The bot, bot performs very well when asked questions about the American Civil War or the French Revolution. It even does a fair job summarizing the historiographical consensus about Abraham Li Lincoln's childhood and the links between his mother's death and his commitment to keeping the Union together. It does a fine work of critiquing British Empire from the point of view of colonized India. So it's pretty good. It performs much more poorly on non-elite perspectives that have yet to be written about in the form of published books. For example, it doesn't have much to add about a recent research project from my friend Jessica Marie Johnson, who's in researching African-American cemeteries in New Orleans, which were pav paved over to make way for white housing developments. It doesn't know about that. It's, that's not surprising. It's a bot that's trained on historical text to tell us about what the published texts say. It's not trained on archives to tell us about the missing elements, although it could be. And hence my statement that the lapses of comp computational history may be more subtle than one presumes. Indeed, the computer's heaviest biases may be more subtle than simply, of tho simply those of gender, race, and class, specifically because Google Books and newspapers integrate so much data from the present-day academy. Bias exists, but it's subtle. It encodes political prejudices against the meaning of different national experiences. So many Northern Europeans might be surprised to read GPT-3's account of why socialism is historically antithetical to democracy. Some GPT-3 answers revealed how anthropologists uh, uh, revealed how summaries of 20th century history portray the Maoist experiments as an unequivocal success. That biased perspective on history, on history um, is probably linked to biases in publishing or on the specific data sets that were used to create this set of answers through GPT-3. And they probably reflect some of the bias of publications and journal articles by American and Chinese universities. Now the problem is that we need more information to understand whose texts have made it into the model and why. There are no footnotes on the answers from GPT-3. 
We don't know where it's getting this information about the history of socialism or the history of Maoism. Um, but the dystopian scenario is obvious. GPT-3 already gives students the material they need to cheat in the writing of a history essay or an exam. It successfully provides capsule summaries of someone's, someone's published history, but not necessarily of the academic consensus or of the program of reasoning that is being taught in a particular classroom or for a particular discipline. The raw materials are in place for the creation of a new field of history, historical production, divorced from historical traditions of understanding, historical methods, issues of debate, or how the consensus is made. AI tools like GPT-3 demonstrate a major approach that is becoming hegemonic in American computer science departments, where researchers aim to refine their technology into a black box capable of imitating human intelligence. The knowledge generated is manufactured by neural nets in which thousands of unsupervised loops pass through program structures called artificial neurons, each empowered to make a decision about the facts held in human language and how to study them. The black box nature of the enterprise is problematic for potential users in disciplines such as journalism or law, as well as history. Any discipline in which the fact and the provenance of facts, where the facts came from, are important. Users of GPT-3 have no access to the sources from which the results are composed. They have no guarantee that computational synthesis matches what a human might produce. Nevertheless, the demand for content from the, for, from the marketplace for advertising is liable to mean that many more bots, such as GPT-3, are writing copy for other services in our future. Now, little help is likely to come from computer science, data science, or economics. These disciplines supply, in a large part, the technical expertise behind GPT-3 and similar developments in Silicon Valley. Students in data science are for, far more likely to meet with studies written by biologists than manifestos and text mining written by digital historians like me. The versions of historical reasoning adopted by authors in biology and ec economics are minimally linked to traditions of history as a reflective discipline which tries to understand the nature of truth in the past. And they tend to abstract the fit between language, that is the text data, and historical experience to a high degree. They make assumptions that no historian would make. They ally the traditions of critique of asking which sources can be trusted. All texts are equal. All data is treated as the same. It can be counted and processed. So just so, in the original Culturomics paper, author Erez, authors Erez Lieberman Aiden and Jean Baptiste Michel argued that many words have a peak followed by a decline. And they suggested that these peaks and declines represented a monumental new discovery in history. In another recent book, Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller advanced, advanced this same claim, comparing the cycle of certain economic theories to the contagion of pandemics. He advanced the case for a new field that he called narrative economics, which would conduct historical research into the rise and fall of certain economic stories such as the fad for the Laffer curve, shown here in a metonym for Ro Re Ronald Reagan's trickle-down economics. Now, Schiller investigates similar, similar curves for bimetallism or Bitcoin, suggesting the rise and fall of economic stories can be mapped like so many tulip crazes. The new discipline of narrative economics, he argues, should form a part of mainstream economics departments. It would be based purely upon text mining and free association, but there would be no recourse to archives, secondary sources, or the traditional questions of history. If GP3, GPT-3 seems dangerous because it may result in the hyper-circulation of historical pseudo-fact, culturomics presents another danger still. Its practitioners, including Michelle, if not Schiller, tend to assert that it is a predictive discipline capable of assessing trends in terrorism before they happen. Indeed, there is a small culture industry for such forms of pseudo-history, manufactured outside the history discipline on the basis of simple curves over time. Akin to culturomics is the historical prediction toolkit called historical dynamics, associated with beetle biologist Peter Turchin, who claims to have stumbled upon law-like forces of the rise and fall of human population that predict cycles of violence. 
in the history of North America and China. Churchill uses them to predict a third world war, which is coming on its way in 2022. Churchill's hypotheses are not based on text, but on demographic data, but they demonstrate some of the compulsion behind, typical of pseudo history that are most troubling to historians. The insistence that societies follow predictable laws, the narrowing of historical craft to a single marketable purpose, the prediction of future historical events to be controlled. One thing that could go wrong then is the displacement in our culture and in the university of historical expertise, the things historians know about how to reckon with historical truth by pseudo history composed of fallacious models. But this is not the only problem. A deeper problem is the culture of faulty reasoning about evidence in the past that practices of this kind promote. Students trained in an atmosphere of quick fix pseudo history are liable to lack the tools for basic interpretation. So consider an anecdote from my classroom. I regularly teach computer science students the tools of historical discovery. I teach them Python, I teach them R, and then I teach them to th think about the past in a course called text mining as a historical method. In an early exercise in this class, I asked the students to count common modifiers of the word woman over the course of the 19th century. One result is the increasing identification of ignorant women in books or parliamentary debates from England over this time. Now, most humanities majors, even after freshman year, are aware enough of the bias of the people writing and publishing in earlier centuries, that when they see this upward curve, they ask questions about me why male representatives in Britain's parliament or the increasingly male community of British novelists were so intent on condemning women for their ignorance. And that is the question to ask. Who is talking about ignorant women more and more and why? The computer science students, however, who are, have their own merits, they have little training in interpreting historical context or reflecting on the bias of language. And asked to analyze the visualization produced by this code, a significant majority of my students composed paragraphs stating that the number of ignorant women in England was rising over the course of the 19th century. A plague of ignorant women. One of the reasons why we need analysis analysts to think about text and not merely through texts is that statements from the past are almost always biased. They are biased def by definition, historically by their time and by their culture, which has always changed and moved on and ch reflected new debates over time, changing in ways that form the subject of an incisive historical study. Those biases are not, in other words, dimensions of the data that have to be identified by an artificial intelligence and removed in order us for, to, for us to get through to the real material of what's going on in the text. They are actually the dimensions of the data that need to be modeled. Now, humanists like Rupika Rassam have been actively sounding the alarm about the dangers of biased data sets and the importance of decolonizing our understanding of the archive. And her insights are very useful here. In the United States, the National Endowment of Humanities has been actively funding initiatives like this one to digitalize previously unheard voices of enslaved people and their descendants, promising to complement the silences of existing archives and to create a richer set of narratives that we can text mine in order to understand a more complicated voice, a sense of the past in which the voices of many experiences are available. But that is not to say that summarizing any one textual archive will produce absolute truth. It's the distance between two different archives, two different sets of voices that produces some insight about the power dynamics of the past and how they have or have not changed. As Rassam's work makes clear, small scale archives are not the only approach for historians who want to bring enlightenment to the digital archives. The annals of Britain's parliament and Britain's newspapers also hold clues to the history of experience, including the history of oppression of subject and colonized people. Even as the escalating phrase ignorant women gives the savvy interpreter plenty of material for investigating the consequences of misogyny in Britain's 19th century parliament. Historians are trained 
to read the voices of power against the grain, to ask questions about the changing biases, the changing nature of power in archives in the past. But they do so deliberately, triangulating what people in the past have said about the necessity for violence against the perspective of people who suffered as a result. Context is essential for correct interpretation. In short, the value of history promising to critique leading institutions from the past, such as parliament, or the law, or the newspaper, or the novel, strongly suggests that historians should not only be rescuing the micro-historical archives of the past, surely this work is important, but also that some historians can begin to embrace text mining as a tool for making sense of large-scale corpora from our past. So in an era when GPT-3 culturomics, historical dynamics, and narrative history produce a thousand versions of pseudo-history at the click of a button, the humanities, and history in particular, have a great deal to offer data science. We have standards for understanding truth, putting, putting multiple perspectives of diverse cultures into dialogue and explaining the way that they react to each other, the consequences of the evolution of ideas and political movements without imposing our bias on the past. Our view on the long-term development of institutions like wealth or democracy, our ability to work across multiple perspectives and data sets, and our claims to handle ambiguity are increasingly important as skills in working with and teaching data. Not unlike the ambitious projects of scientists who handled large data sets, the discipline of history also asks enormous questions about how modern societies differ from those decades or centuries ago. History offers a domain of precision around the categorization of time, which makes historians some of the most active and insightful critics for where large-scale projects go wrong. Computational history, or digital history, has an arc of development spanning decades. It has a prehistory going back to the 1960s, and in, for me, and it, which is complemented by efforts in information science going back to 1949, when Robert Busa began a punch card based concordance of the works of Thomas Aquinas. But as my logarithmic timeline sh suggests, computational history or digital history has been heating up. The last decade alone has seen new books and journals about digital history. Much of the recent digital history involves the involves the application of specific mathematical models to identify what changed and when, often via white box methods that unpack the black box of GPT-3 and use topic models, basic statistics, or word embeddings to illustrate the patterns inside texts. Note how late digital history experiments came to history. While some associate Digital history, uh, digital history with the war over demographic and labor data around Lawrence Stone's attack of, on quantitative history in 1979, or the experiments with public history infrastructure in 1994 to 2006, we have really only just had the first monograph in digital history with Luke Blaxell's War of the Words in 2020, followed by the first monograph based in GIS analysis of maps by Cameron Blevins. In many cases, historians have acted mainly as consumers of existing technologies. However, a few important experiments also prove that historians have been moving beyond being mere consumers of algorithms into co-designing new approaches to understanding data from the past in collaboration with scholars from other disciplines. As consumers, Historians have wielded tools for analyzing spatial maps and network analysis. They've, in, they've looked into dynamic topic models and similar similarity measurements to nest topics of different scales within each other. They've investigated word embeddings, machine translation, author identification toolkits, and many other products of computer science departments. Topic modeling and word embedding have embraced by a small but growing number of historians as tools for indexing large-scale document collections. But the new contributions of historians are equally important. These experiments are distinct because they entail retailoring 
algorithms from information theory according to ideas about what history is or how both subjects change over time or how we understand change over time. I will call this process of sharing based on the strengths of both disciplines hybridization. Simply put, historians in their work model complex interactions between people, the material word, world, and concepts over time. Those interactions can't be replicated with a naive keyword search, just looking for the peaks of words, or computation performed upon rough data. They require careful attention and systematic commitments to hybrid knowledge. In hybridization, historians require special attention from their collaborators, which typically takes the form not merely of training existing algorithms and uncritically accepting the output, but also of recasting the algorithms in new ways so as to extract the maximum contribution from de textual data to the discipline of history. In emergent forms of hybrid scholarship, historians and data specialists are learning to blend their skills to produce new insight about how systems change over time. So here are some examples of what I mean by hybridization. Historians Melvin Webers, historian Melvin Webers has collaborated with a co-author trained as a mathematician, Christopher Nielbo. Together, they modeled change in newspaper text and newspaper advertisements using a Granger curve to ask when newspapers drove advertisements and when advertisements drove content. Another example, social historian Tim Hitchcock wrote a paper with an author trained as a physicist. In Klingenstein et al, Hitchcock and his collaborator collaborators attempted to model Norbert Elias's theory of a civilizing process using topic models combined with information theory to ask the question, have humans become more peaceful over time? Later experiments, in later experiments, one of the authors on the Klingenstein article, Simon de Deo, collaborated with a political historian of France, Rebecca Spang. Spang and de Deo looked at the, at, the, uh, at the archives of the Assemblée Nationale and they used information theory to model influence. The speakers after the French Revolution who exerted the greatest amount of influence on speakers who spoke later. At Living with Machines, Katie McDonough has worked with computer scientists co to contribute new ways of pairing the text on maps with the spatial analysis of GIS, making it possible for the first time to move between highly different distinct modalities of information, the visual and the textual at the same time. Now some observers in the field count hybrid encounters like this as a marker of what it means to do digital history. As Anna Marie Romine and her collaborators explained in their article, The State of the Field, digital history is not a distinct discipline. It is a community of practice where researchers from different backgrounds look across institutional and disciplinary boundaries to engage historical practice with methodological and epistemological concepts of other disciplines. Now, the foundation for hybrid moments has been in preparation for a long time, both in the computer science side of the equation and on the history side of the equation, because both history and computer science have had enormous moments of interdisciplinarity in the past, which have helped to make the disciplines that we know today. Consider these facts from the timeline. In history, the modern discipline of history could not look more different than it looked in the 1970s, when history and art history plus literature were beginning to combine to offer the new methods of cultural history, which drew new insights about intangible changes in social interaction in Renaissance court culture or Victorian cities on the basis of looking at works of art, buildings and novels for the first time as indices of a larger cultural shift. Later, history would borrow from linguistics to create the linguistic turn in both social history and conceptual history, which looked to changing 
language used by workers to talk about their political rights, or the changing language of parliamentarians and philosophers to imagine what a modern nation might be, as an index of enormous shifts in the building blocks of philosophy that have been used by cultures in the past. Now, interestingly, the same interdisciplinary trends are at work in computer science. In the 1980s, computer science combined with biology to begin processing big data, pushing an older discipline, computational biology, into bioinformatics, where computer-guided tools enhance the modeling of DNA and it, the interpretation and classification of brain scans. From the 1990s, modern computational linguistics began looking to statistical and sequencing approaches with the result of forging many of our modern parts of speech tools, some of which are being used from in history departments today. In short, the deeper interdisciplinary history of both fields suggests that hybridization is likely to continue to expand and to fundamentally lead, lead to the transformation of both disciplines. The creation of a digital history is coming out of interdisciplinarity rooted strongly in computer science, even as it's coming out of interdisciplinarity traditions at work in history. We're building upon both. In my experience, one of the chief threats to productive collaboration between information sciences and the humanities is the language that divides the two ways of knowing. Now, when a single word means something different to two communities, it can become a bar to entry. We call such words shibboleths. One of the chief most shibboleths dividing the information sciences and the practice of history is the word prediction. Here is an example of a social science de definition of prediction in machine learning. Shaolin Shu, in her excellent introduction to social science text mining, knowledge discovery in the social sciences, says, for machine learning pro problems, we work with both training and testing data sets. We are more interested in the algorithm's future performance on new data. New data. They're interested in the future. Prediction is a shibboleth. It means different things to different communities. For scientists, prediction means testing data in order to discern a natural law, which, like the law of gravity, is unchanging forever. It was there in the past, it will be there in the future, it can determine future behavior. The essence of explanation in the physical sciences depends on prediction. For historians, the word means predicting the future, which we cannot do. In the 1950s, philosophers of history like Karl Popper took steps to explain why such a math mathematical anticipation would not work. And prediction has been a shibboleth for our field ever since, a bar, we will not go there. The rules of individual identity and reactivity change so massively from one generation to another that predictive laws governing human interactions and the social sciences are an inherent impossibility from the point of view of history. We model societies all the time, but the model is only good for a certain period of time, and understanding why the model came into being and when it stops working is at the heart of what we do. It doesn't mean that we don't model behavior. We model change over time, and we do not predict. We have our reasons for eschewing predictive logic. The historian and philosopher Reinhard Kasselik described what would be required for history to become a truly predictive science. With the predictive science of history, he mused, it would be possible to generalize about the laws of human experiences with the laws of physics, even making it possible to predict the future. The problem was getting there with the data. So Kaselik imagines his ideal database, a catalog of the world's historical events in detail, from catalogs of wars and death to injuries in every battle down to the thoughts imagined in the heads of every human who had ever lived. The database would include notes of each transcription error made in every republication of every text since Aristotle, and the degree to which they mattered to the habits of medieval monks. Kaselik's data set would include all conceivable singular events of all possible histories, and he imagines a massive undertaking that would be required of the world's history departments, a single centralized experiment in collecting data. The historian availed of such a data set, Kaselik believed, would be able to tell how much it mattered 
that one sibling was an inch taller than his brother. They'd be able to create amazing rules showing the psychological uh, consequences of losing a parent by a certain age, or the consequences for history of childhood events, which create a specific cast of mind, such as trauma. Kaselik imagines that such a data set, constructed so as to foreground the principles of singularity and repetition, would allow historians to formulate a truly scientific approach to the past. We may ask, he writes, what is specific about all people, or specific only about certain people, or what is specific about only one person? What is singular in history? The only problem with this confabulation of predictive history, as Kaselik himself explained, is that the data set is a complete fantasy. The data set such as the one he hypothesized doesn't exist, it has never been collected, and it in fact defies everything we know about how real historical collections of, the, of data from the past came into being. And this is Kaselik's point. No prediction machine has ever existed, and no perfect chronicle of the past can ever come to be. Kaselik is explaining why historians don't predict. Had we a perfect data set, we could, but the, but the best we can do most of the time is to describe with an emphasis on change over time in the aggregate. We cannot explain every new idea in human history, and we shouldn't try. We can't explain laws of genius or discovery, but we can explain how capitalism and communism differed in their experience, how modern laws of ownership came into being, where, when, and why, or how the coming of the Industrial Revolution affected everyday relationships between the sexes in the city and in society. Chivalrous-like prediction divide communities of knowledge. Hybrid knowledge has to advance by discovering common touchstones. Predictive, productive research in digital history would be hastened by stripping away these shibboleths. Not predicting, but describing. Not searching for laws of history, but identifying subjects of interest to the field, i.e. the building blocks of history. Discontinuity, change over time, event periodization, and memory. So as a positive correction to the shibboleths that divide communities of knowledge, History can offer a precise vocabulary wherein our knowledge consists. These building blocks represent potential areas where historians would benefit from contributions to knowledge from comput computer science and statistics. And I submit that attention to these building blocks can contribute new research agendas within almost every ar arena of natural language processing. So a quick glossary, change over time, is punctuated by events. Events are observable moments of historical discontinuity. Whether a discontinuity in the people involved, the ideas or feelings or styles of rhetoric or representation under discussion. Events with a definitive lasting consequence may define new eras or periods when everyday realities and rules of the world change in definite ways. And the art of finding those periods is called periodization. Influence represents the modeling of who changed what. It may be conceived of in the form of a book or an individual most quoted or imitated, or the individual event or idea that had the power to change how everyone spoke, even if they used their own words. Events may or may not have meaningful legacies on later actors or whose legacy may be so, so subtle as to be imperceptible for years, as with the writing of Emily Dick Dickinson, who was ignored in her own time but celebrated after her death. Memory represents the working knowledge of the past as it changes from era to era, and as it is passed on through holidays, monuments, references, or anecdotes outside the formal domain of historical research. The archive is the available remainder of the past, and it is separate from the past as lived, which we can never access firsthand. Multiple archives exist, each with their own biases, their own exclusions. There were women novelists in the 19th century, but no female members of Congress till Jeanette Rankin in 1916. Archives are granular and linked in interesting ways. So Congress's archive breaks down into the archives of parties and individuals. Each individual may also have a separate archive of their published memos and letters and writings, which is held outside the archive of the congressional debates. Each archive can be mined for its own temporality. That is, 
Congress may have its own changes, events, periods, and memories, and the Supreme Court may have a totally different set of events or turning points that matter, perhaps the retirement of a Chief Justice. Each party or representative in Congress, each justice in the Supreme Court, very likely has their own record of change, event, periodization, and memory. Describing change with this vocabulary offers an alternative to prediction. New forms of quantification that can help us trace the dimensions of temporal experience are likely to come out of winding mathematics around these historical ca categories of knowing. Descriptions of change over time, modeling that change via interworkings of many variables whose observed influence can be quantified, again described, not predicted, this description of change over time using these building blocks is probably, in my estimation, the route most likely pr to produce a true digital history where we can stand by the facts obtained. We are sure of what we are measuring. We are sure of whose bias we understand, of what happened and what changed. So I'd like to show you some examples from each of these categories of work from my lab and work from other labs that have been breaking down historical change into these different building blocks. The first is change over time. Now, I am not the first person to try to measure language change over time. Already in 2003, Patrick Juola, a computer scientist, was using kullback leidler divergence as a tool for minutely comparing the evolution of language across decades using the archives of Time magazine. But here's my work using a very similar method to Juola's. I'm using word to, rev word to vec to ask about the changing context in which members of Congress invoked the word environmentalist since 1970. Why environmentalist, not environmental? Because the environment had different meanings at different times. The word changes its meaning too much. We can talk about a learning environment or toxic environment, but we all, we all know what environmentalists are. Using the strategy, we can see a gradual shift. We can see some of the, some of the prejudices to which environmentalists were exposed beginning with, with 1980. And we can identify some interesting words like idiot, accomplice, realist, initiator, orator, uh, admirer, oxymoron, or extremist. We can also build on that context, that changing language over time, to zoom in on particular uh, multi-word phrases um, such as activist environmentalist or extremist environmentalist. These two word slurs were counted over time and it turns out that 95% of those slurs against environmentalists were the product of only six speakers in Congress uh, peaking, peaking in the late 1990s and early 2000s around the launch of Fox News. Another building block of knowledge is, call, is the event. Now, some researchers, uh, researchers have already begun identifying change points in language. We're looking at a visualization here from the work of Vivek Kulkarni in 2015. Kulkarni used word embeddings to model which words change their context in Google Books. So here is the changing map of the word gay from uh, gay, gay meaning courteous, dapper, or courageous to gay meaning homosexual and lesbian much later. We can identify change points using Kulkarni's techniques. Rather missing from uh, another approach is periodization. We're looking at uh, now interventions date from 2006 when David Bly retellered LDA topic models to produce a finer view of windows on historical change. We are looking at uh, a very influential project by Jean-Pierre Quante and Alex Rule and Peter Behrman, a political scientist, using topic models in the Senke diagram to model moments of discontinuity and forking in the State of the Union address given by the U.S. president over time. It's this identification of change points where the language of worlds and nations forks into a dialogue about peace and a dialogue about development which allows us to map something like historical periodization through quantitative means. This, uh, we look, see here another 
quite simple adjustment. This is my work in collaboration with Stefan Giorno, who's a specialist in parts of speech analysis. We're using a quite simple adjustment. This is Buongiorno's triples analysis. We're looking at subject, verb, object, phrasing, the most simple breakdown of sentences decade by decade, comparing the 1830s, 40s, 60s, and 70s. Um, we s these, this tool allows the historian to specify the kinds of assertions made about the future in sentences that begin in the future, in the future, we will have a right. In the future, we will have power. They will impose taxes. By the 1860s and the 1870s, we see an explosion of discussions of the ballot, of rights, and the future. In the future, we will look. We, the vote will be taken by ballot. We will have the right. They will have the right. They will have security. We will have power. So we can analyze the periodization of future expectation using natural language processing approaches. Um, this is another approach using distinctiveness measures. I'm using a TF-IDF measure of distinctiveness to find those words and phrases that, uh, that were only articulated in Parliament during the 1800s, but not in the 1820s, during the 1820s, but not in the 1840s. This, uh, this is from a forthcoming publication in the American Historical Review, which suggests that distinctiveness measures can indeed be used to characterize uh, those those temporal fossils which were which were important to one moment in history and thereafter disappeared and we'll move on to memory memory is another one of the building blocks of history it work represents the working knowledge of the past as it changes from era to era there's been less work on memory it's a historian specialist term there's m less work on memory in the computational disciplines, but I think there's a lot of promise here. This is looking in the parliamentary debates of the 19th century merely for mentions of other years. I'm looking just for numbers. Now, it could be there's room for error here. Some of these numbers may be actual raw numbers, but very frequently, if there's a four-digit number that begins with one, it is a reference to a year. And this allows us to make certain conclusions about the work of memory in the parliamentary past. For example, uh, in the 1840s, as the modern conservative party is information, we see this vertical line of references to the Tudor past, these 16th and 17th century dates. If you look them up in context, it turns out the conservative members of the par of parliament are referencing the Tudor past in really kind of minor ways. They're talking about uh, church vestments or the earldom of Mar, you know, something that doesn't have a lot of consequence for political debate, but they're trying to create a frisson a feeling of being grounded in the past, of being the ancient party of England. So we can model human behavior towards the past by looking at references to memory. And another example of modeling memory is looking for using, in this case, named entity recognition to find references to events in the past. This is a double timeline. On the x-axis, we have the 19th century from 1800 to 1900. On the y-axis, we have a much longer timeline of events referenced in the past, from the Magna Carta to the Glorious Revolution. And we can find moments of explosion, like the glorious references to the Glorious Revolution peak around the Reform Act of 1832, when the middle class gets the vote. They get the vote in part by arguing that they represent truly Protestant England. And so references to the Glorious Revolution centuries before become important. But this raises interesting historical issues, like the persistence of allusions to the Magna Carta on the one hand, but also less frequently allusions to the Spanish Inquisition, which turn, turn out to come up in 19th century debates about parliament any time someone wants to denounce bureaucracy. This bureaucracy is just like the Spanish Inquisition. It's, like, it's, kind, it's kind of like alluding to fascism today. I object to this bill. It's from the Spanish Inquisition, and so on. So the work of memory. Digital historians work with all of these categories of temporal experience, iteratively and critically, when they engage computer models. And the selective reading of primary texts, historical content, and theoretical concerns. They offer new perspectives on the past. And this modeling of the past helps us to distinguish our own experience in the present and to arrive at an understanding. 
Now, I will reinforce something I have written about elsewhere, which is the principle of critical search. It is sometimes assumed that this work is automatic, that we deliver an algorithm to the text, and then the result is like pushing a button, automatic history, no historian required. I differ from this. I have elsewhere proposed a critical search process that never treats the algorithm as a bo black box or a test of ultimate truth that can offer a final perspective on the long durée. As in other social sciences, historians prefer a validation step required for every computational process. And that validation requires analysts trained in historical methods to reckon with the fit of algorithms to archives of increasing complexity. When they are armed, however, with a critical and nuanced approach to the study of cultural experience of time through text, digital history stands to play a leading role in the development of data science that takes text seriously and reckons with the reality of different and evolving cultures, each of which has its own experience in relationship to time. Our discipline comes forearmed with models about the relationship between individual and collective, hegemon and subaltern, long-term continuity and short-term change. And each of these insights each of these models and theories is crucial to making sense of what our world is awash in. That is, enormous data, enormous scale, textual data, ho housed in different formats, much of it incomplete, where ideas and individuals may show up across silos, where the laws of behavior we might wish to model are themselves always changing. With the help of collaborators in the information sciences, digital history can build more sophisticated tools for the robust modeling of culture and change across messy data sets. We can ask enormous questions about discontinuity, influence, and periodization. And we can answer in more interesting ways the ordinary problems of data sets. I'll close with a very minor challenge for those of you from the data sciences. If you are a data scientist or a computationalist of any kind, the first small step towards a historically sensitive analysis is one you can take on board with a simple exercise of considering the temporal nature of your data set, of any question of significance. So consider the sort of project that might, you might produce an argument about the most lasting change in Congress, or the New York Times, or Twitter, or your email inbox. And consider this as a new version of salience. Maybe the most important email or tweet is not the one that's most read or liked each in, in, within a year, but maybe it's possible to use the context of each individual tweet to understand a moment when everything changed. Not the most read, liked, or quoted influencers, but the ones who changed the hearts and minds of the people linked to them as tracked by the appearance of new words. Can you devise a measure of significance linked not to popularity, but rather to systemic change? If I'm right, this challenge should make you curious enough to start reading, perhaps reaching out to hum humanists about how it is that humanists model time, cultural influence, and change. And you will probably have something to offer in terms of turning that into a quantifiable mathematical model, perhaps more than one. Perhaps there are multiple dimensions of historical change. The discoveries about temporal experience that we are working on create complex interlinked bodies of historical texts with implications for data science at large. After all, events matter to everyone. The, rea the reality of historical change has implications for every branch of information that engages with textual data. Thank you so much, Joe, for that really provocative uh, lecture. Please keep asking your questions in the Slido, and I'm going to uh, join the fireside chat with Joe now to ask her some of the most popular questions. Thank you again, Joe. Um, that was fantastic. Um, we have some questions coming in. Um, they've been being upvoted, and I'm going to go in with the top voted question. Um, it's from Maya. She thanks you for your strong argument that historical method can improve data science, 
But what about historical method itself? Can it benefit from data science and how? And I, I think you were getting at that at some of your suggestions, but it would be great if you could elaborate on one or two. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, in a longer talk, I meant to, to give some more shout outs to Lara Putnam and Luke Blaxell, who are digital historians who have written, Lara's, Lara's written some really fine articles thinking about the transnational and the text searchable. So how is it that, uh, how is it that these new archives and being able to search the newspapers illuminates new truths about history that we really literally did not have experience uh, access to in the past. Uh, and she makes the argument there that before the advent of these, these digitalized text databases, it was prohibitively expensive for most historians to visit other continents and so to follow the lives of immigrants. But we can start to link them, even with something as basic as as uh, keyword search, not to mention linked data, in which you have the opportunity to, to, to uh, track names. A shout out here, here to Niall Wellahan, who's just published a really fine book in which he leverages the power of newspapers from Argentina to California to New York City, tracking the lives of Irish immigrants. It's not technically a digital history book. He didn't use any algorithms, but he's beginning to expand the power, if not the actual process of the digital me method, he's beginning to expand the reach through applying Lara Putnam's ideas. So that's really powerful. And then I think uh, I mentioned Luke Blaxell's monograph, which is really a must read for our field. Uh, the first two, the introduction and first chapter um, are really a kind of epistemological investigation into how it, what it is that text search can do that we couldn't do beforehand. And one of, the, one of the comments that he makes that I find so moving is that he says, historians have been guilty of some hand-waving in the past, some generalization. You know, if you want to think about the Stanford denunciation of the humanities as traditionally the fluffies versus the te techies, well, it's a little fluffy to say, generally in the 1890s, the liberal party, thus and so. But as Luke demonstrates, now that we have textual analysis, many of those generalizations about collective behavior that historians are deeply interested in can be nailed down in a precise way. And we're realizing, we're realizing that some of the generalizations of past eras of historians who tried to do this just by sampling from the archive, reading one letter at a time, some of those generalizations were wrong. So there's a, in a sense, text analysis adds a validation, a fact checking step to the historical method that stands to make history more robust as a social science. Mm. Its claims more grounded and true and precise, especially when we're dealing with generalizations over time or with larger groups of people. Mm. Thank you, that's a, great, that's a great answer. I'm actually gonna mush together two um, questions now from Liz and Rennie um, about the practical implications of empowering interdisciplinary approaches. So how can you make this uh, a, 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 a process that has less friction? How can you empower historians to have those collaborations? Yes, that's a wonderful, it's a wonderful question. So uh, it, I think for most people who have been practicing in digital history or the digital humanities over the last decade, we have, we have been able to do this work in interdisciplinarity because we have been somehow protected. Mm -hmm. So for example, both Ruth and I have been benefit beneficiaries of national grants, which were designed in a moment of enthusiasm over interdisciplinarity and large scale textual archives, where we were encouraged to make connections with data scientists. And for me, this has been tremendously intellectually provocative and fruitful for my research. And we've had all of these wonderful conversations about how research is changing. And I know for you and everybody on the Living with Machines project, that's also true. Mm -hmm. um, but we are living, we have been living, as it were, under a kind of, you know, sacred bubble in which, in which you can talk to the plants and animals and the data scientists talk to you. In the bounds of a normal history department, one is required to publish articles, one is pub required to publish books, and without special dispensation from the dean or special research grant, there's often not time to learn about a computer, a computer language or the modeling and artificial intelligence. So I, I guess I just want to say to anyone who's listening from the funding agencies, the importance of these grants and the importance in the universities of permanent institutions in digital humanities that can form protected spaces for special classes, for advanced students to learn about these methods and the needs of each discipline and to invent them. You know, those 
the people who invented the linguistic turn, the cultural turn, or who invented modern computational bioinformatics uh, or computational linguistics also needed protected spaces where they could work. That's one of the reasons why these innovations sometimes come out of more privileged institutions. So we need those commitments. We've seen huge commitments to interdisciplinary data science at universities like Cornell and Stanford, which have not included digital history uh, or digital humanities to a large degree. They've been very good with cybersecurity, very good with bioinformatics. But our field is advancing and c has so much to offer digital data science and computer science. We have new questions, we have important disciplines, we have robust ways of understanding truth, the truth of human behavior and these enormous databases of text. And there are many of us who ha are at this point trained and looking for opportunities c to collaborate. So I think that's, you know, that's something that administrators and funders really need to take on board is that there's, a, there's an opportunity here at the juncture of the digital humanities. Here, here. I think Making that space is important because it takes time to build a shared understanding. So yes. making and protecting space, I think, is absolutely crucial. There's a great question here from Lorenzo. Um, how can you detect and compensate underrepresented data? So that's a, that's a wonderful question, Lorenzo. That's one of the, the, the top questions we've been talking about this week at Living With Machines. So one of the traditional fears of most social historians, with good reason, is that in this era of mass digitalized text, underrepresented voices, which are not necessarily underrepresented numerically, but the people who didn't have access to publishing or access to parliament will just vanish from view as everyone starts to text search the available digital documents online. And so if you think about the English working class, the people who are weaving the cloth, the people who were working in the factories, the people who are getting sent into the mines at the age of six, to, to shuttle the coal out of the mines, to feed the factories in the British Industrial Revolution. People write about them, but they usually don't have the time to write voluminously themselves. So they write many fewer pieces of, they deliver many fewer pieces, artifacts. On the other hand, if you know that that is a bias of the archive, that there are fewer of the more important voices, and let's just say that they're more important because there are more of them, this was a real experience of the Industrial Revolution, then you won't make the mistake of simply counting the number of references to happiness and wealth and concluding that industrial, the Britain of the Industrial Revolution was a place where everybody was wealthy and happy. Instead, you can take the few working class people who wrote sermons that we have, or wrote newspaper articles, or founded a printing press. There are those voices. They wrote eloquently about their own experience. Uh, Emma, R. Emma Griffin is one of the foremost historians of that moment and of those texts. You can take those texts and start asking questions about their influence and their community. You can ask questions like, was anybody in Parliament writing as if they were familiar with John Cartwright or with Methodist sermons. Who in Parliament sounds the most like the Irish radicals back home in Dublin? So those questions, those are mathematical questions that we can measure. We can measure by proximate vectors. We can create mathematical models that help us to amplify questions about working class or marginal experience. You know, the voices of enslaved people, the voices of colonized people, who they were talking to, who listened to them, which is a really exciting frontier of inquiry. Now, I know no, no published papers on this. This is simply a forefront of knowledge. I'm showing all of my cards. This is what we're excited about. One of the things we hope to write a grant about sometime soon. Thank you so much, Joe. Sadly, we're out of time, even though there are lots of really good questions. But um, I will share them with Joe, and maybe she'll be able to answer them asynchronously. Thank you, Joe, so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Um, thank you everyone for coming and can I ask any of you that are interested in Joe's other work on the Long Land War to stay around. We'll be back in half an hour for another lecture. I don't know how you do it. And I'll say <laughs> that uh, the <laughs> next le if you consider yourself a data person, the theme of the next lecture is about technology and humanity. Once again, it's about the role of data and technology in reckoning with climate change. So if just because you don't think you're interested in the United Nations, please stick around. I have a lot to say. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Okay, um, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.